shall be done. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Whatsoever you ask it, in my name I'll do it. It's no secret that we have now entered into the year of 2019. What is interesting is that in the back, amen, that God is ahead of our year. We've said it before here, I believe, but back in the fall, they entered into 5779. We entered into 2019. Now, with that said, we have all heard the story that I read to you tonight. But I want to share with you revelation within it that is relevant to us, I believe, today. I want to share with you one phrase that the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me. And my desire is for the Father to reveal His heart regarding this season, this appointed time that we're in. Now, you folks are no stranger to how we preach. And you know that I've said oftentimes that in my preaching... We don't start in the middle, but we go to the very beginning. And to go to the very beginning of the scripture text that I read to you, you've got to go in the, amen, in the Kings chapter 16. When you look at the first Kings chapter 16, the 29th to the 33rd verse, you've got to understand that there was a man by the name of Ahab. Ahab, and we're going to paraphrase it, we're not going to read it, but Ahab became king over Israel. Now verse 16, amen, it tells us in verse 16 that he, amen, or in the 16th chapter, that he did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. What did he do that was evil? He not only did, amen, evil things according to his own will and desire, but Ahab married a woman by the name of Jezebel. Jezebel was a priestess for the house of Baal. She also was a princess. Amen. She was the one who actually ruled the kingdom. And the Bible tells us that Ahab did more to provoke the Lord than any other king before him. That would be a bad place to be in at if you did more to provoke the Lord than anybody else. But Ahab and Jezebel, we understand, amen, were not one to follow after God. They did not follow after the God of their people. But yet Ahab allowed Jezebel to begin to influence them in Baal worship. I don't know, I don't think it was ironic that Brother Whitaker and I had a conversation before church. He was talking about the, amen, the temple of Baal or the arches of Baal. My spirit was leaping. I knew what I was preaching on tonight. They begin to tear down the altars of God. They begin to raise the poles of Baal. And they begin to have Baal worship. The Bible tells us that Jezebel loved her priest. Amen. That she loved them. She took care of them in her own palace. But I'm here to tell you that no matter how dark it gets, that there's still somebody that's willing to be a voice for the Lord. Because in 1 Kings chapter 17 I'm laying a foundation that we're going to preach. But in 1 Kings chapter 17 verse 1 we're introduced to a man by the name of Elijah, which meant strength and mighty, the almighty God Jehovah. He was from the tribe. Of, uh, he was a Tishbite. Uh, he was he was an inhabitant of Tishbe, which means recourse in the Hebrew. Uh, a recourse is a source of help in a difficult situation. Uh, the use of someone or something as a source of help uh, in difficult situations uh, or in struggles. Uh, that's exactly what Elijah was. Hang with me. It's going to get better. Elijah states, amen, to Ahab after Elijah was introduced, Elijah states to Ahab that it's not going to rain. Nobody ever declared such a thing to anybody before. Nobody ever predicted the weather like that. But he said, I want you to get prepared, Ahab. It's not going to rain until I say so. After this was made to King Ahab, God then began to instruct Elijah that he must go on a journey. And Elijah goes to the brook of Cherith, and there he hide himself according to the word of God. Now we find that here at this brook, Brother Chris, God commanded the ravens to take care of him, and he drank of the water. When you begin to 
look at the name of this brook, Cherith. It means a cut. It means to cut off or down or asunder. It means to destroy or to consume or to make an alliance or to bargain. It means the cutting of the flesh. Isn't it something that after Elijah made such a declaration, the first place that God took him was a place of cutting, a place of cutting the flesh to destroy or to consume. I'm looking for some people tonight that are at Cherith that says, I'm in this place where my flesh has been cut. Now listen, I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. 2018 wasn't a popular year. If you talk to anybody that has any type of relationship with God, you'll find that this was one of the hardest years of, of spiritual warfare that you and I had ever went into. I've walked into 2019 and it's not let up much. But I'll tell you this much. I can either allow those things in 2018 take me down or I can allow those things to shape me up to what God has called me to be. And I don't know about you, but I chose to allow those things to allow them to sharpen me. I went through some flesh cutting experiences these past few years. I've went through some hard places. God has had to cut me down. He's had to humble me down. He's had to let me know it's not about you. It's not about your emotions. It's not about how you feel. But it's about me and it's about what I'm calling you to. So he's at this place of cutting up the flesh. He begins to drink water and the ravens begin to feed him. But then, after the brook begins to dry up and the raven ceases and they no longer feed him, God said, I want you to make a journey down to Zarephath. There's a widow there that I want to take care, that I want you to be taken care of by. Now, when you begin to look at the word Zarephath, I want you to see this pattern. When you look at the word Zarephath, the word Zarephath in Hebrew means refinement. It means to fuse or to to refine or to purge away. Notice it's a deeper place. Come on. Come on. So God took Elijah, a man, from the place of cutting to the place of purging. Come on. Come on. Mm -hmm. well. I'm going somewhere. So he went from the place of cutting where his flesh was cut to a place of purging where God began to purge uh, those impurities out of him. He sees a widow uh, who has just enough flour to bake herself a cake. Uh, she was going to bake herself a cake uh, and then she was going to eat it and then she didn't know what was going to happen. He makes another statement, amen, that is so profound. He said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make me a cake first. What do you mean make you a cake first? Don't you realize I just got enough meal to take care of me? I don't have enough meal to take care of two people. I only got a cake for myself. But she obeyed the Lord. I'm here to tell you that's why scripture says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and in his righteousness. Then all these things will be added unto you. I'm determined this year, Pastor, that if I'll keep God in the forefront of my life, if I'll keep God where that he needs to be, and I'll exalt him high above anything else in my life, whatever I have need of, God's going to supply that need for me. Whatever I need him to do, he's going to do it. Is there anybody on a Saturday night that'll help this preacher? out tonight and says I'm right there preacher I'm ready to give God everything that I have yeah. isn't it something that God becomes our last resource in certain situations yeah. but what happens when the woman put God first then God not only supplied her what she needed that day but he gave her an overflow Whoa. See, when you allow the flesh to be cut away and you are purged, he will sustain you, amen, and he will keep you. What happens after, amen, this woman takes care of him, uh, her son dies. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Now Elijah is faced not only with a widow, he's faced with a widow who's sonless. 
But what happens? Love story short, the son is raised back to life. Elijah performs one of the first miracles that is recorded in scripture in his ministry. He goes in there and he raises the boy back to life. Now how can such power be manifested through this man of God? I'll tell you how. He knows what it's like to be cut and he knows what it's like to be purged. If you want that type of anointing on your life, if you want the type of anointing that will raise the dead things back to life in your life, you need to be cut and you need to be purged. You see, she knew he was a man of God. Hey Amen. What happened after her son was raised to dead? God commanded Elijah that he needed to approach Ahab. He runs into a man by the name of Obadiah. Obadiah, we find in 1 Kings 18, was the one that had 50 in one cave and 50 in another. And he tells Obadiah, he says, I want you to send a message to King Ahab. Tell him to get ready because it's getting ready to rain. Uh, rain. Obadiah says, you don't understand. If I tell Ahab that it's you, he's going to take my life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. From that conversation, we go on to the top of Mount Carmel. And on the top of Mount Carmel, the Bible says 450 prophets of Baal was there versus one man of God. What was the end result? Elijah said, why hold ye between two opinions? If Baal be God, let him answer by fire. But if God be God, let him answer by fire. Long story short short. Amen. Baal's prophets did all that they could. Nothing happened. Elijah dig the trench, put water around the altar, and then the fire from heaven fell. Burn up the sacrifice. Lift the water in the trench. And by one man, 450 prophets were slain and killed on the top of Mount Carmel. Oh. Now when you become a threat to the kingdom of the enemy, he's not going to just sit back and let you go on your way because when Jezebel found out that her prophets were slain she was furious and she told her husband we're going to find him and when we find him we're going to take his head let it be unto him what he did to the prophets of Baal. Now this is a man that just saw miracles. This is a man that just went through cutting. Brother Connor, he just went through purging. This is a man who's seen, amen, the supply of flour. This is a man who's seen a boy raised to dead, and he just seen fire come down from heaven. You would have thought that he had enough anointing in God in him that he would look and say, okay, Jezebel, bring it on. I'm ready for you. No, not Elijah, not this strong man of God. What happens to him? Well, when the warfare begin to increase in his life, when Jezebel put a hit out on him, we don't find him standing up against the enemy, but we find him running and escaping in a wilderness. We find him running for his life. Isn't it something that while we feel the anointing and the glory of God, we're ready to take every devil that comes against us out. But it's in those moments when we're standing by ourselves. It's in those moments when there's nobody else around us. And when the enemy comes in, either we can stand and realize that the Spirit of the Lord will raise a standard against him. Or we can run, tuck our tail under, and we can run away in the wilderness. Well, confession's good for the soul. And I'll tell you as far as this preacher, you may see me on this side, but you don't understand oh. that there's moments in my life where I could have stood against the enemy, but I allowed myself to run in the middle of my warfare, and it was easier for me to run in the wilderness than it was for me to face the enemy. You know how many times I wanted to resign. You know how many times I wanted to quit traveling. You know how many times I've told the Lord I'll go to church. I've said it here before. I'll sit in the back of the church. I'll be a good church member. I'll pay my tithes. I'll clean the bathroom. I'll sweep the floor. I'll bring the casserole. Amen. To the potluck. I'll do all that. I'll even let somebody else do it and I'll be their armor bearer. I'll do that. I'll iron their clothes. Come on. Come on. 
Hallelujah. We got to talk after church, brother. <laughs> I'll do all that. And the Lord said, nope. I didn't call you to do that. I called you to stand. Come on. I called you to get in position. But not Elijah. Now we find Elijah in the wilderness sleeping underneath a juniper tree. Do you know what the word juniper means in the Hebrew? It means a broom. But it's a root word that means to be yoked up. So now, listen, we're talking about a man. If we, listen, if we saw literal fire from heaven fall into this place tonight, we all would be slain in the spirit. Come on. And let's be honest. If we saw God miraculously move physically like that, we will walk out of here ready to whoop every devil that came down the pipe. Amen. Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. The last thing we would do was run into the wilderness. Amen. But I'm here to tell you, Elijah now was under a juniper tree. This is where the Lord began to deal with me. He said, I've called my people to come out. He said, but when I go looking for them, they're yoked up to all kinds of stuff. Amen. I've moved in their life. I've given them blessings. I've shown them my power. They've seen come miracles. On. They've seen signs. And they've seen wonders. And they're ready to go. But in the midst of their warfare, they find themselves sitting under a juniper tree, yoked up to fear and anxiety, yoked up to all this stuff. Well, I've come to tell you, God said it's time to get in a position because there's a great reveal that's coming. Come on. Well, give me about five seconds of prayer. and try to behave myself. But I feel the power of the Holy Ghost in this place tonight. I feel deliverance here. God's going to call some Elijahs to come forth in four winds tonight. Somebody shout hallelujah. You see, notice he was asleep. He was having a pity party for himself. Angel came to him one time and said, get up, get up. Eat, drink, you're getting ready to go on a long journey. Come on. Get up, Elijah. He fell back asleep. Sister Crystal, you had to wake him up a second time. What are you yoked up to tonight? Come on. Come on. You know what God's called you to do. What are you yoked up to tonight? Come on. He didn't get I amen. Mean, he got yoked up. God woke him up. You thought, okay, now that's good. What does he do? He retreats, and in verse 9, he retreats into a cave. He retreats into a place, a cavern. It means cavern in the Hebrew. It means to be bare or to be naked. He got to a place of vulnerability. He got to a place of exposure. Amen. Sometimes warfare will cause us to run and hide. And we stand there naked and exposed. You see, God asked Elijah a question. While Elijah was in a cave, God didn't call him to be in a cave. Listen, we're talking about a man that had enough guts to look at Ahab and say, it's not going to rain. I don't care what you say. It's not raining until I say so. We're talking about a man, a man who was, a man taken care of by the, the ravens, a man who went to Zarephath and God took, a man raised the dead. Fire came down from heaven. He whooped 450 men with his own hand and slayed them. And now he's in a cave hidden somewhere. How many of us have retreated? Come on. Mm -hmm. How many of us, amen, have retreated in the cave? We knew, listen, Elijah knew he was called to something great. He knew the calling that was on his life. He knew the anointing that he had. Amen. Pastor Steve, he knew exactly what God had called him to do. Yeah. But yet he was in a cave. Here is, amen, where the Spirit of the Lord took me. He said, my people have dwelled in the cave too long. Oh, oh, oh. I'm going to be real. Listen, I'm not, I, I was talking to Brother Steve. I'm not political behind the pulpit, nor am I going to be tonight. But I'll tell you this much. God's people has, amen, we've sat in a cave and they've passed bills. Yes. 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 
We've sat in a cave. And now in some states, they can have, amen, late-term abortion. Murder. Amen. We've sat in a cave. And they, they now try, they've redefined what marriage truly is. Right. We sat in a cave and church is now more about a feel-good experience than it is a life-changing experience. Come on. We sat in a cave, amen, to where now, amen, if you preach the gospel and you preach it hard, they tell you nobody wants to attend your church because now they want to come to a church where they can get coffee and donuts before service, come to church in their pajamas, get a pat on the back for 15 minutes on how good and wonderful and blessed they are, and then they can go out with their gold star, amen, and their spiritual intactness, saying that they've done God a justice by showing up to the house of worship for two or three hours. The boss said, I'm Looking for some people who may have retreated in the cave. They may have been hidden. They may have not come out in the forefront. But I've got good news to bring to you. The remnant of God's people are getting ready to get into position. Oh, there's an army that's rising up in this last hour. Is there anybody that I can preach to tonight? What did he say to him? He said, God, you don't understand. I'm in a cave. And I'm the only one you got. Yeah. <laughs> Lord, I'm the only one going through this. Nobody else is going through what I'm going through. This is the worst thing I've ever been through. And I'm going through it by myself. Nobody understands. Really? <laughs> All of what Jesus went through and he don't understand what you're going through. Really? Preach. Amen. Sometimes you talk to folks. And you try to give them godly counsel. Amen. And they look at that. You just don't understand, Pastor. I said, no, but God does. I may not understand what you're feeling, but there is one that knows what it feels like. There's one that knows what it feels like to be rejected. There's one that knows what it feels like to be scorned. You want to, You say you don't know what it feels like to be lied on. Jesus does. You don't know what it feels like to be betrayed. Jesus does. You know what it feels like to be whooped up on. Jesus Jesus does. He knows everything that you and I ever go through in this life. He said, but I have overcome the world. And because I have overcome, you are going to overcome the world also. That's a good place to shout right there. That means your situation doesn't dictate who he is. And it doesn't change the fact that he's able to bring you out. Come on. God's coming to tell some Elijahs tonight, what are you doing here? What are you in the cave for? Uh, you don't understand, God. I'm the only one you got. I'm by myself. And then she seeks to everybody else that you have. God, I know you said you had a remnant, but everybody else is forsaking you. Mom. Doesn't it not seem like that now we're the minority? Yeah. Mm. I'm talking about, amen, they call us radical. <laughs> I'm talking about, amen, Christians who believe in principles. Christians who do not just bear the name, but they live the life. Isn't it like we're a minority? Those who don't believe that you can, amen, sip on alcohol. Those who don't believe that you can use curse words. Those that don't believe that you can go to certain places and be entertained as the world is entertained. Those don't... Uh, <laughs> Amen. That our conversation must be upright and holy. The way we present ourselves and our integrity, amen, needs to be upright and holy. I'm not talking holiness on the outward because we went to that extreme too where we looked the part but we didn't have the part. Uh, we had a form of godliness but we denied the power thereof. I'm not talking about holiness on the outside. I'm talking about holiness on the inside. I'm not talking about greasy grace that makes you do whatever you want to call this cover. I'm talking about grace that keeps you from sinning. Grace that keeps you from falling. And grace that will keep you in the midnight hour. Whoa. I've often times this past year, my dear sister said, God, is there anybody left? Come on. Come on. I feel like I'm by myself. People think I'm crazy. People think I'm radical. People say, you, you're an old soul, Matt. Amen. 
Amen. This is just not the way it is anymore. That's the way the church used to be. Listen, if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he hasn't changed, why in the world have we changed? He said, I'm the only one left. How many feels like sometimes you're the only one left? I'm be honest. Amen. God didn't say, God didn't look at him, Connor, and say, you know what, Elijah, you're right. You just stay right where you're at, Elijah. Bless your little heart. <laughs> what did he tell Elijah to do? He said, Elijah, I want you to come and I want you to go forth. <laughs> go forth. The word go forth means to go, to bring, to break out, to bring forth. He said, I want you to go forth and I want you to stand. Somebody say stand. 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 Stand means to abide. It means to appoint. It means to arise. It's a Hebrew word that means place. Here's where I'm going. The word place means a standing, a spot, a condition. It means to rise up, to get up, or to hold. Has God told Elijah to go forth and stand? He's telling us the same thing. I want you to get in place. How many will agree that there was a whole lot of shifting that took place in the kingdom last year? Amen. How many believe there's still a shifting? Yes. I heard a man of God say, amen, two weeks ago, that the, amen, the magnetic force of the earth, amen, that is shifting constantly. That NASA used to only update it, Brother Steve, once in a while. But now they're having to meet regularly to update it because the magnetic, amen, shields or forces that's underneath it. That's why we're seeing so many earthquakes. Matthew 24 says earthquakes in diverse places. The word diverse meaning different places. Amen. They're fearful that even some of the states, amen, that an earthquake can hit it and it's going to break it apart. Amen. From the United States and float out by itself. Amen. Isn't it something that those things are happening now? It's because God said these are the signs of my return. We were talking before church. Anybody seen the article this week where the Pope amen, has met to sign a declaration for a one world religion. Hallelujah. We've not seen it the way like I said I'm not political so I didn't come to be. But I've never seen a government so messed up and all my life. Oh, Hallelujah. Oh. Listen, I'm not here to feud whether you're on the left side, the right side, the donkey side, the elephant side. I'm on his side. Oh. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You can have your own views if you want to. But I'll tell you what. The only thing that's going to change this nation is not an elephant. It's not a donkey. Amen. It's not a, amen, anything else. It's not a senator. It's not a house of representative. But the only thing that's going to change America is if my people, which are called by my name, honor who's in position. We must pray and respect uh, who God has put in office uh, whether we like them or not. Uh, but the bottom line is uh, they can't change it, but Jesus can. And instead of us rallying around trying to do this and that and the other, we need to come together in unity. We need to get in position and let the United States know that we're ready we're armed and we're willing to combat the enemy in this last hour. Yeah. I'm trying to behave. Hallelujah. I have all this in me this week. Bring it out. And it just has to come out. He said, I want you to stand in a place of position. The word position is a place where someone or something is located or placed or arranged. What position are you talking about? I'm talking about a position in prayer. God's been stirring me about prayer. Mm -hmm. I mean, pray, really praying. Mm -hmm. Fasting. I've been stirred up about fasting. You mean God's going to require me to fast more this year? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Two places you don't come against a child of God, their pocketbook and their stomach. <laughs> 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 obedience. A position of obedience. A position of commitment. A position of holiness. A position of dedication. And the list could go on. Are you in position? 
I think I told your pastor this. I may have said it the last time I was here. But about two or three months ago, I was in prayer. Amen. Just me and the Lord. And I've said it before. I don't know why the Lord chooses to speak to me at the gym, but he does. Hallelujah. And I was at the gym. And I was listening to worship music. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, heaven's in position. And I said, okay. He said, but are you? And I seen a question mark, and I said, nope, I'm not in where you really want me to be. I love you, I serve you, I'm doing what I can for you. And you know how it is, you start giving the Lord a list of stuff that you are doing. But God, I'm traveling, I'm preaching, I'm doing all this, I'm, I'm doing this, I'm, and the Lord's like, nope, you're not in position. You see, it's time to get there. We got to be in the right place at the right time. Heaven is in position in 2019, are you and I? What happened when Elijah was in position? The earthquake came. Surely the Lord's in that. And then after, and it rent, amen, the rocks, and the rocks began to break. And then after the earthquake, there came a wind. And after the wind, there came a great fire. But the Lord was not in either of those elements. Now, if it had been me, that would have been enough for me to say, oh, I'm done, I'm going back into the cave. Because I'm sure it wasn't comfortable for Elijah to stand, at, amen, at the mouth of that cave and to be shook to death, almost blown over, and then to have fire roll over you. Listen, amen? What happened? Because Elijah was willing to stay in position. Because Elijah was willing to stay in that place that God called him to stay in, he received a great revelation. What was the big reveal for Elijah? What happened was God said, here's what I want you to do, Elijah. And in a still, small voice, ha, God spoke to Elijah. Listen, uh, some of us just need to realize uh, that God isn't in the earthquake. Uh, he's not in the great wind or even the fire. He's looking for somebody that will just hear that still, small voice. Uh, and when Elijah heard that still, small voice... Uh, Hallelujah. He said, Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah, why are you here? Amen. This is Matt Leslie's commentary. Elijah, is this where I called you to? Elijah, I called you to stand before an evil king and an evil queen. Elijah, I called you to be my voice. I called you to be my prophet. You are a recourse. You are a help in a difficult situation. I called you to be my prophet. I didn't call you to sit under a juniper tree and waller in your pity. I didn't call you to hide yourself in a cave for nobody to know where you're at and for you just to move away and run and hide. But I called you in this hour for such a time as this as he said, as Queen Esther said, I've called you to stand and to declare what I'm saying. And Elijah stood and he wrapped his face in his mantle. His prayer shawl. Amen. His power. He wrapped his face in his prayer shawl. And the Lord spoke to him and said, Elijah, here's what I want you to do. What did he get revealed? God revealed to him the plan that was going to destroy the reigning of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. Because when you study it out, those who God mentioned to Elijah... God strategically used all three of them to destroy King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. Amen. But Elijah would have not received that revelation on how, listen, what if he stayed under the juniper tree? Come on. Amen. What if, I'm about to go somewhere, what if, Brother Chris, he stayed in the cave? What if he didn't come and get that revelation that Queen Jezebel and King Ahab would have ruled a whole lot longer than they did and they would have caused more destruction? What if we stay in a cave? Come on. 
What if we stay underneath the... I, somebody, I just heard somebody say that Jesus is coming. We just need to stay tight until he does. Listen, we don't need to just sit on our hands. Uh, amen. And just do all this, that, and the other. And let the devil wreak havoc over our nation and over our marriages and over our homes and over our churches. And us just take a back seat to it and not say anything. But I've come to tell somebody, it's time we get out of the cave. It's time we get into position. There's a great reveal that's coming up. To this nation, there's a great reveal that's coming to this world. Oh, I need about two or three people just to help me right now. Am I making any sense? And then, he, then, then I love God. I just love how God does things. Because Sister Tina, I love what he said. He said, oh, and by the way. Because <laughs> he knew that Elijah was having a pity party. He said, I want you to anoint Haziel. I want you to anoint Jehu. I want you to find Elisha to be the prophet in thy room. But oh, by the way, you say you're the only one I've got left. Oh, by the way, you say nobody else is on my side. Oh, by the way, you think you're all I've got. I've got 7,000 people who have not yet bowed their knees to Baal or caused their mouth to kiss him. I've come to remind the devil tonight uh, that in a world of compromise, uh, in a world where the church uh, has become more worldly, in a world where they don't want to hear sound doctrine, having itching ears, uh, being seduced by spirits, uh, that there's a remnant of God's people. Yeah. Yeah. There's a remnant of God's people uh, who have not yet bowed down to compromise. Uh, there's a remnant of God's people who have not yet bowed down to popularity. But they declare, we've been in a cave, but we're coming out this year. Oh. I've come by to tell four winds. Hallelujah. It's time we get in a position for the great big reveal. Here's what the Lord said to me about 2019. He said 2019 is going to be a year of revelation. He spoke so vivid to me, and he said, do not ask me to give you a New Year's resolution. Amen. Come on. He said, because you say you're going to make a resolution, and then in three weeks, you drop it. Come on. Guilty. Come on. Come on. You know how it is. I'm going to start this year. I'm going to eat healthy. And then after eating cardboard for two or three days. Come on. <laughs> You go through the drive through of McDonald's and you pray and resist, but that, amen, sweet tea and Big Mac just calls you. Woo! <laughs> I'm going to go, join the gym. I'm going to join Planet Fitness. I'm going to join the gym. You go religiously for the first two or three days. The third day you take a. And I'm not, I mean, I'm not being, amen, I'm not knocking anybody. I'm guilty. I'm not as motivated as I once was. No. <laughs> but that's resolutions for you. We make those resolutions. We're going to change our life, but then we don't stick to it. Yeah. How many resolutions have we made concerning the house of God? Come on, we come into watch night services. I'm not condemning you. I'm just telling you, hey man, I'm guilty as charged too. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to get in the word of God. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to read two chapters a day. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray. I'm going to get up early. I'm going to get up an hour early before I go to work. I'm going to get up. I'm going to pray. Your starts, we, that first time we get excited, we get up. We, we pour our cup of coffee or your choice beverage, Mountain Dew, whatever it is in the morning to wake you up. Hallelujah. And you pray. Pray fervently. Amen. But two or three days when that alarm clock goes off. Snooze. <laughs> God, I'll pray during my lunch hour. Liar. Come on. I'll pray when I get home. Liar. I'll pray before I go to bed. Lord, in the name of you. Guilty as charged. God, I'll read more. I'm going to read more of the word, God. Lord, I'm going I'm, I'm to watch as much as I'm going to devote my TV time. I'm not going to watch my favorites. And then, it, you know, amen, all of a sudden you just can't wait to what happens next. Amen. You've got to DVR it and you got to get home from church because you got to find out. 
Amen. You got to know who the mass singer is. You got to know. Amen. They're taking the mask off. You got to find out. Amen. I'm being honest with you folks. And I said all that to say this. God told me. He said, don't make a New Year's resolution. He said, ask for a New Year revelation. He said, well, the resolution is just temporary. He said, but a revelation will change your life forever. I don't want a resolution. I need a revelation. I need God. I need to get myself in position to get a revelation from the Lord. Amen. This is what the Lord told me about revelation. He said, I'm going to reveal. Do you know what the, the word reveal means? He says to make known to others, to bring over, to carry. He, amen. It means to be denuded or to uncover. Here's what God said. He said, just like I told Elijah that there were 7,000 that had not yet bowed. He said, I'm going to do a great reveal in 2019. He said, those that have dedicated themselves to me, I'm getting ready to put them on display. Come on. I'm not saying it just to be saying it, but I'm telling you that 2019, God's going to show four winds why he's called them to the nations. Amen. This is the church to the nations. Amen. Folks, pastors, amen, ministers, folks who have not bowed down but who have kept themselves. This is the year for the great reveal. Yes. Amen. The earth travails. It longs for the sons and daughters to be revealed. Did you read that in your Bible? And this is what the Lord is wanting to do. Amen. He said, this is the year of the great reveal. He said, I'm going to uncover. Amen. He said, I'm going to uncover. I won't mess your hair up. I'm going to uncover. I'm going to uncover. I'm going to unveil. Amen. He said, when I uncover, signs and wonders are going to follow them that believe. Come on. When I uncover, they're going to lay hands on the sick and they're going to recover. When I uncover, they're going to cast out devils. Hallelujah. I was talking last weekend. Amen. With the pastor we were at in Fairborn. We were talking. Amen. God's calling us back to, especially as a Pentecostal church, he's calling us back to the power to cast out demonic spirits. Hallelujah. We're not going to wrestle on the floor. Amen. We've seen in our local church. I've got folks that, amen, that will confirm. We've seen even in our local church here recently. Demonic demonic oppression and spirits of lifted off of people's lives. I was telling your pastor, amen, in the past two services, we have had an overflow of God's presence like we've never experienced. I wasn't there to see it Sunday. I was preaching somewhere else. God called us there. Amen. I got about 15 text messages after church Sunday morning. I said, God, I don't want to miss out. Amen. Let it, let it happen Thursday. I'm telling you, Thursday night, heaven opened up and the floodwaters came into our sanctuary. People were healed, delivered, set free. Hallelujah. People received words of encouragement. Why? Because God's revealing. God's causing the covers to come off. And I've come on a Saturday night to an evangelistic service to tell four winds. You're in position. You're in the place. Let God do the unveiling. Let God reveal. I'm going to end you. I'm going to end with this. 2019. 2019, comp the difference in it is the 19. It's comprised of two numbers, 10 and the number 9. When you look at the number 10, the number 10 in Hebrew means divine order. It means completed cycle. It means a measure or a group. A comp interestingly, it means a completed congregation. Hallelujah. It means a completed body or a completed kingdom. And then when you take the nine and you add it to that, the nine is the last, the largest single digit, and it signifies finality. It signifies judgment. Can I tell you that judgment's coming? It must first begin at the house of God. I don't mean to go back to it, but listen. Amen. The, uh, I'm trying to behave. But the same sacrifice that they did in the Old Testament to Baal and to yeah. the God Melech is the same thing that's happening in the United States of America. God did not bat an eye then. He's not going to bat an eye now. Right. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. But judgment's coming. 
But let me remind you that on the flip side of judgment, there is blessings. There is mercy. Come on. And there is grace. Amen. Judgment came to Egypt, but God's people did not have to, amen, suffer the consequences. Amen. 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 It means fruitfulness. Nine represents the womb. And here's where I want to go. It means, amen, that when nine months is over, what has been concealed on the inside is now going to be revealed on the outside. Amen. So 2019 is a year of revealing. Yes. It's a year of acceleration. Mom. It's a year where God is going to take the covers off. He's going to expose those that are not doing it the right way. And he's going to exalt those that are in covenant with him. This is the year. Amen. That God's going to truly cause the transfer of the wealth of the wicked into the hands of the righteous. I read a story on the way down here, and I'm ending with this, but I read a story on the way down here, amen, of a gentleman who, amen, wanted to have a public, amen, Christian school in his area, and he began to wrestle with it. He didn't have the means, didn't have the students, didn't have the money, didn't have anything, and he began to wrestle with it, and he told his sons and his family, he said, all I know to do is to make it a matter of prayer. All of a sudden, God began to supply the needs. There was a local contractor who gave him the material and gave him the labor. There was a local, amen, church who sponsored it and they gave him, amen, the finances. He needed desk and he needed books. The local school system found out, donated the desk and the, amen, and all of that. Long story short, his school was thriving. It, amen, he ran that school for over 20 years. And they got to the point to where they had too many students in there, Brother Steve. They couldn't house them. And he wanted to buy a trailer to put on the outside of the school to make more room. And the cost was going to be $7,000. He didn't have it in his budget, and the school didn't have it. And he said, I'm going to make it a matter of prayer. And he began to seek the Lord, and he began to ask God to move. There was a young couple who contacted him and said, can we come and see you? He said, sure, you can. And they came to his office and sat down. And they looked at him and said, what do you need for the school? And he began to smile at them and said, actually, I've been praying about the Lord to provide us a trailer. He said, I need a trailer to house some more students. We've got an influx of students and we've ran out of room. And they looked at him and said, how much is that trailer going to cost, Pastor? He said, I priced it at $7,000. That young man and that young woman looked at each other and they began to smile. And they reached a check over to him. And they said, on the way here, they said, the Lord spoke to us and said, write him a check for $7,000. Come on. What am I saying? I'm telling you with an assurity that if God did that for him, he's going to transfer it into our hands. I'm going to tell you, I have stepped out on radical faith this year. I've already told my wife. I said, we're going to, I'm believing the Lord to do some great things. I begin to speak payoff in my life over to some things for the Lord to open up some doors for me to have more free time. Amen. When it comes to ministry, and I'm telling you, God is moving up and God is working and God's going to do it. Why? Because this is the year where God's going to reveal what's been concealed. I'm not a money preacher and I'm not preaching on money. But I'll tell you this much. The devil's had his hands on it too long. It's time to get transferred into the hands of the righteous. Amen. God's not going to give it to us so we can go around and gloat and tell everybody how rich we are. But God's going to give it to us so we can fund the kingdom of God. God's going to give it to us so we can pay churches off. God's going to give it to us so we can pay ministries off. God's going to give it to us so we can be a blessing to other people. God's going to give it to us so we can bless Jerusalem and bless Israel. Because if he can get it through us, he's going to get it to us. Come on. Amen. So I end on that note to tell you what does your 2019 have in store for you? Amen. Amen. It's the big reveal. God's going to reveal. God's going to expose. 
God's going to cause finality. You know what finality means? It's done. It's over. It's fine. He's going to make the enemy's tactics. He's going to put them into finality. He's going to make them finalized. He's going Do it.